Learn how a seminary teacher accepts Jesus and leaves Mormonism next on the Ex-Mormon Files. Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Ex Mormon Files. I'm your host, Bishop Pearl, and I appreciate you joining us. And uh, we have today Cindy Bauer, who's come all the way from Hawaii. My joy to be here. appreciate you coming and sharing Wonderful. your story. Thank you for letting me. As we usually do, we try to find out where people are from and where were you born and what's your background a little bit. I was born in California and then. Before Which area? The, Which area? Uh, Southern California, Southern Glendale. California. Okay. And before my first year was. Over, I was sent to live with my grandparents in Castledale, Utah, which is just outside of Price. Yeah. Most people don't know where it, where it is, <laughs> even Utah. I actually do, but... Uh -huh. yeah. It's a tiny little town. Yeah. And so were your uh, grandparents or parents uh, active members of the church or members? I only know the first active one was one of my grandfathers was on mission with, with David O. McKay. The only oh, ones that him. I definitely <laughs> knew, the ones that I actually had interaction with, I would put them all in the category of being Jack Mormons, except oh. for one uncle who was a bishop and high priest and oh, okay. all the things that go with that. Yeah. But you did go to church quite a all bit. All the time. They made sure, oh, I think they... all of my cousins, in fact, were all Mormonized, churchized. We would all, all go to church go and to participate. Church and, and, yeah. uh, a couple of my aunts, maybe only one aunt, actually married a Mormon. The rest all married outside the church. And, it took them farther away, but I would have my commitment to Mormonism really blossom in my teenage years and then become really solid in my early 20s, oh. very, very active. And you just had good friends or something and you went to church? and I think it was more than that. I think it was my identity. I think it was something that I saw as a way to claim life. I came from a pretty broken home. Hmm. And even though I knew I was supposed to have a good family, I yeah. would end up moving out when I was 13, but so wanted to look like I had a good family. I can remember going home to ask permission to do something, going to my mother's house where I didn't even live and standing in the backyard and pretend like I was myself and then pretend I would I'd be me and then pretend like I was her getting permission. I just wanted to feel like somebody cared about me. Yeah. So I was just so looking for that connection yeah. and Mormonism became that connection so it just took me deeper and deeper into Mormonism to where it became the identity for my life and what I was doing yeah. I would I was teaching seminary as well as Relief Society really? I teaching taught a, seminary, huh? a genealogy class for three hours every Sunday and was very 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 completely involved in the church and would actually be in the middle of teaching seminary when uh, Jesus would actually pull me out of the Mormon church yeah, tell us about that. What actually happened? It, it's an interesting transition because I was saved at the end of the Jesus movement. And so the Spirit of God was so huge. Now, were you in California now? Or By then I moved Castle back to Dale? Southern California. Okay. No, it was all in California. In your high school days were in Correct. California too? Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's where I was teaching seminary um, and would substitute on the institute level. So I was pretty committed to wow. knowing the... Were you ever running into anything that you didn't uh, agree with or things that kind of came up that you thought, well, I'm teaching this, but I'm not sure I... <laughs> I would be just the opposite. I was such a committed Mormon that I've, I saw that one of the prophets had said it. I accepted it and believed it. it. <laughs> and I can remember I let a back when they had the big dance festivals in the church. Oh, sure, yeah. I brought a team from Dearborn, Michigan, my early 20s, brought them to Utah for the dance festival because it used to be held at, right here the, at the Utah State University. Right. And I remember that as I was getting ready to take the girls into the, the festival, no, into okay. the temple grounds, you know, oh, the first yeah. thing you do, you have to go there, especially if you come oh, from sure. Michigan, you sure. oh, got to go check it out. <laughs> And it's, it's like going to Mecca, I'm sure. You just you <laughs> sure. have to make your way in there. And, and back then, so, uh, that was decades ago. I'm only 25, but that was right. decades ago. <laughs> I got you. And uh, there was a man standing out there handing out tracks. I didn't know what it was. I just took it and put it in my pocket. Didn't think anything of it until I was sitting in the bleachers waiting while the girls were practicing. And I didn't have anything to read. Reached in my pocket. There was a track, and there had been some 
crazy. You know, they did. They the track was showing some of the crazy things that Mormons believe. Uh, Adam on Diana, and the <laughs> Garden of Eden's really in Missouri. The Tigris and Euphrates are the Mississippi and the Euphrates. That Noah's right. Ark was built in North Carolina. It just went on and on with all these things. And I remember reading that and not even flinching at any of it. I just kept going, yes, 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 yes. And they would reference which prophet had said it. But I think the first, very first witness that I ever had to the truth of the gospel was that little track where when I turned it to the very back, it was a simple Romans road written out, which is, is it died for my sins. I can remember that more than you I can really remember do. any other page. And it wouldn't be till years later that that seed that fell on such stony hard ground <laughs> would be cultivated and activated. Uh, and I, you know, I used to think the guy was horrible for handing out that kind sure, of stuff. Sure, we would judge them terribly. Oh we? yes, <laughs> and so I always tell people. Do you now, ever know who it was or no who, idea. who offered it? No, I, I just can. So I just you remember never him know. handing. And you, you have those Kairos know. moments, those yeah. aha moments. I can remember him handing it to me. So I, I, I tell everybody I can hardly wait till I get to heaven and Jesus Find introduces us, and I can tell him thank you. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you, thank you, thank you. That it's been a. From there, I wouldn't even think, I never thought of leaving the Mormon church. It no. was never on my mind. I wasn't unhappy as a Mormon. I hadn't, hadn't become a Jack Mormon. I was living the word of wisdom. People always try to find a reason that you leave the Mormon church other yeah. than finding Jesus. Right. So I'd been run through the ringer with that over and over and over again. And I wasn't looking to leave the Mormon church. I, had, I remember um, Munson was the president of the church, and he told us to plant a garden, so I'd gone out and dug up my mother's front yard. Anything they <laughs> said to do, I would do it. Oh, gosh. So it was uh, actually meeting Jesus that took me out of Mormonism. Not false doctrine, not being mad at anybody, not having a lack of a testimony. It was meeting the true and living Jesus. And, and tell us about that. What, did, what happened? I was actually working at a company that was owned by my Mormon bishop, stake president. He later became stake president. Uh, and all of a sudden, somebody walks in the door who really knows Jesus, and of all things, he didn't drink coffee. So he immediately became the golden contact. I don't know if you can remember when we used to wear those golden oh, question marks absolutely. and everything. absolutely. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, Speaking uh, of President McKay, he's the one that had those. Oh, is he the what one that What do you know about the Mormon church, and uh, would you like, like to, to know, know more? more. <laughs> yes. So he was just perfect. You know, he didn't, didn't, didn't have to work on the word of wisdom with right. him and stuff. And he had been led by God to come and work there. And it seemed like he'd been a missionary in Africa for five years, came back, and God leads him to work at a Mormon, Mormon-owned company. And he didn't realize what God was going to do through him. And there would be, end up being five of us that would come to the Lord through his witness, uh, myself and my brother, one full-time missionary, one man that <clears throat> worked there, and then another BYU graduate. All of us would come out of the church in this sweeping What kind of change. things did he say, or what did he... Uh... How did he get you thinking? <laughs> well, first he would introduce us to Jesus. I can remember as a Mormon being asked to pray all the time for different meetings and stuff. And I'd come around, I'd be around him and I didn't feel like I could pray. I mean, I had the King James English down perfectly, <laughs> but you, when you were around him, you could just sense a, a radical relationship with God and you knew you didn't have that. I had the right words to say, but I didn't but have that, that sense of Jesus. Or well, it was, it was just so hugely different. And I'd never experienced that before in my life because I'd only been connected with Mormonism and Mormon people as far as prayer oh, was goodness. concerned. So th there was just this sense of that there was something different about him. And as Mormons, we'd always said we were the ones that were there was this, <laughs> a difference about. Definitely qualifies peculiar people. But there was just a sense of Jesus around him that was so real and powerful. And he would just be, be him. And the, this many of us would connect to Jesus. Well, that's amazing to have such an influence on, I guess, good Mormons there in this company. Yeah, it was crazy. I, I was just meeting up with, a, just yesterday, meeting up with a young man that became a Christian that was on his full-time mission. And we were just sharing stories back and forth and all the craziness and everything that went on and, and happened. Because it was quite a loss to both of us as far as losing family and... Uh, being completely cut off. When I left the church, all my seminary students were told to not come around me, and everybody was told to stay away from me. Um, my bishop's that wife. That is hard, isn't it? I mean, it's... Well, you know, there was such grace on me that I, I just kept loving the Mormons more. It seemed like every time they'd try to do something that was mean and hateful, I would love them more. I can remember I felt led by the Lord to take him Christmas 
cookies and say hi I love you and if you could have seen their faces when they opened up the door and saw me there with my little Christmas basket it, just, ah. just to show the love that uh, Jesus had it just I wanted to know them I still love them no matter how they felt about me well besides his example which is tremendous did you read a scripture or did you what you say you sense Jesus um, or you you experience it was Jesus, all so to speak, Jesus or? and then that put me in a position to be open to hear that Mormon doctrine some of the heirs of the Mormon doctrine but that's not what I focused on it was definitely the Jesus movement in Southern California was huge and so I would go to all these things that were happening and I'd hear the gospel over and over again. And Had you ever, you, you'd never really understood or heard about grace before, probably. No, Mormons you, don't understand grace. No, I didn't understand grace as no. a Mormon because I knew I had to work. And the Mormon scripture is you're saved by grace after all you can do. Well, right. where's grace then? You know, <laughs> it, it's lost. It's, it, so there were certain things that uh, I would go to the uh, Christian church and then go teach seminary. I'd go to the Christian oh, church either on a Saturday night and then be teaching what seminary. Did th what did you think, we ask this, or I ask this often, but what did you think the first time you went to a Christian church? I thought it was amazing. A lot of people don't know what the Jesus movement was like, and so it was a lot of concerts. That's where you have contemporary Christian music is born out of the Jesus movement. So I didn't, I wasn't mad at anybody, Mormonism. I just totally fell in love with Jesus and fell in love with church. I could sense the spirit of God there. After I came out of the church, I asked the Lord, you know, why me? Why not Donnie and Marie or <laughs> president of the church or something? And he just spoke to me so gently that it was because of the prayers of Christians. So I don't know where these wow. Christians were. I know my, my um, biological father was not a, not a Mormon, but I don't know where these prayers are. I've asked God to show me some of the people <laughs> just to say thank you. So it's been kind of one of those things in my life. But there were so many Christians praying at that time uh, that something would happen with the cults near the end of the Jesus movement. Yeah. It was just everywhere. And I was the first one that I know of that was fully active and walked basically out of the, I'd already been in the Christian church, but walked out of the doors of Mormonism. I never went in active as a Mormon. I never walked away from anything of Mormonism until I walked into the arms of Jesus. Now, was doctrine thrown at me and different things. Most of the time I knew what they were going to throw at me. I wasn't right. an uneducated Mormon and because I'd already accepted it. One of the things that had happened that I think was really significant is I had picked up uh, Mormonism shadow of reality and uh, not bought it. I mean, it was in somebody's home and I just Sandra picked it up and started, Tanner, so. Sandra, Tanner, started reading it. And there was a temple ceremony in there. And my bishop had told me, he had said, you know, you can go to the temple now, but I really suggest you wait until you get married. So, you know, if they say it, you do it. So yeah. I said, okay. <laughs> And I just was flipping through the book, not with an attitude to find anything out, but just a curiosity. And all of a sudden, there near the back of the book is a temple ceremony. Right. So that was the one carrot that I'd never seen that I always had questions about. And I read that, and I was just shocked. I yeah. said, "What? This is what I'm waiting for? You've got to be kidding me!" <laughs> you know, I, what? What? I kept going. And so I remember just closing up the book and immediately going home. And I called this elder then that. Uh, I told you came out with me yeah. from that witness. And I, I asked him, I said, will you promise to tell me the truth? And he, he could tell he's a little suspicious what I'm going to ask him. And I said, you have to promise to tell me the truth. So finally he relinquished and said, okay, I'll tell you the truth. So I told him what I had just done, which so, now I know was grounds for excommunication. I didn't know that then. <laughs> right. uh, and I said, is it true? And he waited a few minutes and he said, yes, it's true. And he said, when I left the temple after going there for the first time, people asked me if I still had a testimony. So I'm going, oh, my goodness, oh, my goodness, oh, my goodness. <laughs> and I think that was one of the big cracking points because I wasn't having, I wasn't reading that in the presence of Mormonism or having to right. look like I was spiritual. I was reading it just, just as a clear fact. Right. The rest of the things that most of them had said, I can remember I went to Walter Martin's teaching at Melody Land Christian Center and he'd be talking and I would just go, let me teach that. You're not teaching it right. You know, I would go, this is the way it goes. Not, not a good Mormon. Or, nah, a yeah. good rendition of Mormon right. doctrine. So right. it was, uh, but still it was that gentleness of, of Jesus. And that's why I feel like I, I really had come to the Lord way before I went forward to publicly let people know. Jesus says, if you uh, will confess m me before others, I'll confess mm -hmm. you before the Father. So I, I had learned how to hear the voice of God. I'd had this amazing, so many amazing experiences. Had, did you feel you'd had a born again moment or was it just a kind of a processional? Well, probably where I was finally able to let go of Mormonism was 
I was driving home one night and I could just sense there was something supernatural happening. I was crying in my car with no really good reason to be crying. And it's just that different tears that you feel from uh, when there's this uh, huge spiritual moment. And I was at, stopped at the corner of Cherry and Market in Long Beach, California, and I was weeping at the stoplight. <laughs> and I heard the audible voice of God speak to me and say, Mormonism is false. I remember having a hold of my steering wheel and just screaming, it can't be, it can't be. No. And again, God spoke and said, Mormonism is false. And that finally gave me the ability to separate myself from Mormonism because I kept kind of being a, a hidden disciple <laughs> of Jesus in Mormonism. And I'd take the things that I'd learned. It makes in, it hard to teach, yes. isn't it? <laughs> well, no, I'd go and teach the stuff and they'd I'd teach what I'd learned at the Christian church. Right. I'd go teach it in seminary or the Sunday school class I was teaching, whatever. And they'd go, wow, where'd you get this yeah. stuff? There's something different about you. I can see a change in you. And I kept going, whoa, that's not what they're supposed to say. Yeah, so right. That was probably a bigger witness to me than even yeah. the, uh, the so-called anti-Mormon or exposing Mormon, right. I like to say. Yeah. Uh, information. And I would go home that night. I would set my alarm for early in the morning, spend time in prayer, had it all planned how I was going to have the day work because I hated the thought of being wrong. Oh, you know, so all the Christians around me, I just I want them to know that they were right and I was wrong. My goodness, that's so embarrassing. So I had it planned. That I, would, I would go forward uh, that night. And I, that way, no Christians would be at the church service I was at. And I could just tell them the next day and keep my composure. I would, so I told nothing, said nothing to them about this experience in the car when I was driving to church that day. And the first thing that happens is I walked in and I, a black woman was singing. Well, this is before 1978. Okay. And I, I'd never seen a black woman in church, let alone one up <laughs> singing in front of me. And right. it was like, God did this huge, big thing just to break my heart forever thinking I was better than anybody because of my color or being born in the covenant, out of the covenant, any of that stuff, all of a sudden was just broken. And it's so interesting because God would end up stationing me as a, putting me as a missionary in the middle of the South Pacific, which is the only place where all three races are oh, indigenous. Yeah. And I, if I don't see some brown and stuff mixed in, I think I'm in the wrong place. It's very strange. When my daughter went to college, she says, Mom, it's just too white here. So we decided that God knew what he was doing when he made color, and yeah. it, it wasn't a, a curse or something put on him. Well, so, don't, don't we just judge, though, don't we? As, as Mormons, I, I at least judged. And but, like you say, you didn't oh, have a relationship. Oh, you felt you were better because you were right. white, and if you were blonde hair, well, yeah. blue eyes, white and delightsome, right. born to Salt Lake City. they were not valiant in the preexistence. Exactly. <laughs> they, yeah. they'd, they'd missed it. So it was a very interesting, radical God thing that God would do. And then the pastor had started giving the message. And I had prayed that it would be something that would really rock my life and stuff. And I, he's getting off the subject. And I just go, Lord, he's getting off the subject. A little prayer went out of my heart. Nobody else heard it but me. And immediately the pastor said, I know I'm getting off the subject, but I want you to know that God is leading me this way. Now, people can say that that was just coincidence, but I promise you, the more they'll pray, the more coincidence they'll see. <laughs> more, that's good. And then finally, he began to give the altar call. And as he was, there was hundreds. This is, uh, there would be 12, 15 people deep for the altar call. And, you know, I still had the plan. I was going to do it on my schedule right, because sure. I wanted everybody to know that I was in control. <laughs> and all of a sudden, the pastor says, okay, there's five more. And I remember it. Just thinking, wow, just five more I have to wait for. By this time, mascara was running. Everything was wrong with me to look at me. It was just a complete mess. And he, when he said five more, I kind of sat back a little bit relieved. I only had to wait for those five. And he said something about one. And then he said, and some of you, God spoke to you in your car. And I, I, <laughs> I had told no one. I've never heard anybody say that in an in a altar call before, since, or, before or since. Or since. <laughs> and it was just like, wow, 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 wow. And I went forward that day, and I've never looked back. Going forward that way, I love the Mormons now than I ever did before. It wasn't a question of being upset with any Mormon, about losing a testimony. I just knew my testimony was false. Yeah. And understood that just because you believe something doesn't make it truth. Truth has to be settled on the Word of God. I mean, I can remember when I was about 21, finishing reading the Book of Mormon and literally seeing my chest on fire. It was a real experience, but it just led me deeper into a lie where the other experiences that I would have in coming to God would lead me to the truth and the foundation of the Word of God. So it was a pretty crazy <laughs> um, transformation, yeah. and it was never 
n never something, it was never something. It wasn't something that I could define for you completely except that I met Jesus. I didn't even get disenchanted with Mormonism. I just radically exactly. found Jesus, Jesus. and he, that became a non-truth And to you've me. done a lot now to share this journey that you've been on. Uh, Oh, through yeah. different ministries, Exciting. and then you've been a missionary, and uh, I still am. Yeah, I always. Uh, after I got married, I married a, my husband, a Christian, and he asked me to give one year to missions, and so I said okay. Uh, that was forty, forty <laughs> years ago this year, and I'm still. I, I remind him that I'm still on that one year commitment. So yeah, that, <laughs> you can but, get out any time. <laughs> right. Yeah, but we've traveled all over the world. Uh, my kids had been to more countries in the United States. Uh, it's been, uh, to share Jesus is just the heartbeat of my life, to take it to places where it, where it hasn't been shared. I was just in Cuba, and it's the first place I've ever really wanted to move to besides America. I mean, just move and stay there. Generally, we would go out for months and then come back. We've been stationed in Hawaii since we first went to missions. Hmm. And, so again, it's not a hatred for Mormons. It's a oh, love for no. Jesus. I and was, his message. Yes. I was just meeting for a friend uh, with a friend that lives here now, a childhood friend, the only one that really speaks to me from oh. before Jesus. Yeah, you said. And yes. <laughs> she said, when I brought up something, she said, well, I just don't want that, our friendship to be about that. And I, there was a placard hanging on the wall, you know, you never know when your days are going to die, you got to pay attention, say what do you ever want to say to somebody. And I just pointed to that, and I said, well, there's this, and so I want you to know who I am and what's going on. Oh. But she didn't want to listen very badly, but no. I just have to believe that God's word does not return void. And so I, I shared as much as she would let me share with her. Yeah. So it's, a, it's a challenge. Uh, and there's uh, so many Mormons that are happy to talk about it. They're always happy to dialogue with you about it until it starts to get kind of tough and then they'll have an appointment, you know, <laughs> and have something they have to go to. Yeah, I don't know that they're and I say this in my case as well, that our knowledge base is very shallow and we don't know much about the Bible. We don't trust the Bible. Mm. And so what we know is, is not very deep. And, uh, and when we start finding out that there's a problem, we want to back away from that discussion, I think is what happens. But I think it's true. It wasn't my, my situation. It wasn't my, what happened with me. Uh, so it's, uh, I wasn't even pulling away from Mormonism. Yeah. I just got pulled to Jesus. Yeah. And when I left the Mormon church, I was the first one that anybody knew about that was active and left. Mm. Most of the people up until then, I think now there's more people that, were at, that are active yeah. and leaving. Right. But back then it was unheard of that because was... Christians just pulled away from it. Mormons or yeah. any cultists for that matter mm -hmm. and would make it, the, the witness wasn't heard. I went to church with... I grew up in a Dutch Reformed area, of many amazing Christian friends, but they would never share the gospel with me. And I can remember after I got saved, I was act, asked by a youth group to come and share my testimony. This is in Southern California. And I said yes, and I was walking down there, and I mean, I walked in the door, and there was one of my dearest Christian friends. And I shared my story there then, and she came up to me afterwards, and she said, forgive me for never sharing with you. Oh. So it really does pay to share, as you've already you, said. You don't know what it's going to... You might just yeah. leave a little stone that causes somebody to think, a little, a little tidbit that they yeah. can't get rid of. One-liners are the most powerful witnesses you can give. Yeah. Rarely does somebody remember a sermon, but they'll remember one Some line. Some kind of a line. Now, you've, as I mentioned, you're in different ministries and doing things. Maybe you could share a little bit about what you're doing, if you care to. Or? Sure, I'd love to. Uh, one of the, right now, we're the largest distributor of food to the hungry, the homeless, the working poor in the state of Hawaii. We work with at-risk youth, and some of these kids have no hope except for what we can bring to them through Jesus and the work we do to mentor them and to love on them and to say they're of value. Uh, we work a lot with the homeless. Uh -huh. They're some of the most devalued people in our society right now, and so it's yeah. exciting to stand beside them and share Jesus with them and let them know they do have a value and a purpose. We're very involved internationally. So we're, uh, I mentioned I'd just been to Cuba. I was in Costa Rica. I'm getting go ready to go to Vietnam and uh -huh. Cambodia and Laos next month, uh, November. Uh, so we're, we're, because of these are humanitarian efforts that you're doing, these countries allow you to come in. Right, so we're into North Korea as humanitarians, oh, wow. and 
even to get into behind. We have a big work in Bangladesh, for example, and so we're getting in, able to get into the Muslim countries. And we come in first as somebody that just wants to serve them. Hmm. Now, do, do you you don't do you remain Christian? I mean, are you handing out Bibles at all, or is it more about food and? Well, the big th the thing that when you go in, especially these foreign countries, that would keep you out if you said you were a Christian missionary right, coming in. Right. You're able to do what it is that you have to do. So maybe it's help with whatever. I mean, we were 45 days in Sri Lanka after the, the tsunami. Oh, yeah. so I can remember being there and just digging bricks for their homes with my bare hands out of the ground. So they could rebuild their homes. Right. Oh, gosh. And then after you've done your humanitarian part, then they, may, they while and after they meet you, and you just represent Jesus, and that's who you talk about. So you're able to be this great witness to them by first serving them so that they want to learn about you. Yeah. That you then can share, and the love of Jesus comes to you. And Jesus was always caring about the life situations and the life needs of everybody he talked to uh, throughout the entire Gospels. It's a great wow, way to what take a great gospel. love uh, for God and for your fellow mm. man. I mean, that's meeting the, keeping the commandment that we've been given, isn't it? And no, it's exciting to be a part of it. It really is. And you get a lot of support and people that are willing to help. And We have a lot of people working with us, and we've also uh, started BAM, Businesses Ministry, so we have a coffee bar. And <laughs> uh, if anybody wants to come to work there, the first thing we ask them uh, before we'll even interview them is to make sure they're ready to be a part of who we are and we say first of all you have to know that you have to welcome the homeless and if that'll be difficult for you then you won't be happy here yeah. uh, we allow them to just come in and plug into all the electricity they need to mm -hmm. get their electrical things working and be a, allow them to be what they can be we don't require them to buy a thing and uh, we just <laughs> love on them if they say yes to that then we said well if you come on you've got to be a part of our giving back so you won't receive any tips working here <laughs> See, all our tips go to help helping the yeah. poor, those in need, the kids at risk, whatever we're concentrating at that time. And then I said, do you still want to listen to the interview? <laughs> and they'll say yes. So then the next thing I'll say is, so we're all Christians here. And if you're not a Christian, because you can't ask somebody when you're hiring them whether they're Christian or not, then if you're not a Christian, know that this is a very Christian environment and you will hear about Jesus a lot and we will be praying for you. Do you still want to be hired? <laughs> And, and then they've always voted point, yes. Huh? Yeah. I haven't had one person say they wouldn't stay on, so it's wow. pretty. I didn't want to finish the interview. That's exciting. So that's kind of the whole thing that we're doing with as far as business, and we're awesome. we've brought change to the sex industry in the little town we're in, with closing down a strip bar that had sex trafficking and prostitution oh. and an eight-bedroom brothel, the second largest porn shop in the state, a nasty liquor store that sold <laughs> porn and porn toys. It was just, wow. It's just been an amazing transformation, and nobody can believe that we've done it, and they keep asking for our business plan. We said we didn't have one. They say, just well, how did you do this? God, huh? Yeah, we say it was by being obedient to the next thing that God told us to do. So it makes no sense to most can't, people. You can never be wrong there. <laughs> no, and people are, when you, when you say that and they see that it's happened, yeah. there's no argument. So that's exciting. Well, Cindy, we're out of time almost. <laughs> Goes fast. Uh, yes. Anything you, I know you said you lost family and friends when you uh, came out, and maybe one or two of those will catch this interview somewhere along the way. Anything you'd want to say to them or just to... I think the biggest thing to recognize in all of our lives is that there's points of deception. And then within Mormonism, it's a com such a complete deception. There's a lot of good things that have been mixed in yeah. with Mormonism, a lot of truths, because the enemy works by telling half lies, just like he did to Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. And I always tell the kids that we work with, a half truth equals a whole lie. <laughs> and to recognize that there could be things in your life that are deceptive, and to ask the Holy Spirit to show it to you, and especially to those that are hooked into Mormonism, to be open, to be have the deception exposed. Just yeah. ask God to show them. Ask God for truth. Yes, yeah. and then grab hold of it. I know it's really hard to leave as a Mormon. Could cost you everything and then some. So I lost my job too, where I was working for the Mormon company. So oh. I lost everything. But I and the friendships so that you'd had with the seminary students and oh yes, of those, all of them, so. everything gone. So yeah. everything before Jesus completely taken away. But you would you change anything? Oh no. Yeah. I know, no, 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 no. Yeah, and I, I, I look at either. sometimes when I'm teaching a class and I go, Do you realize I wouldn't even know you if I hadn't found Jesus? And it just blesses me so much. Uh, 
Cindy, thanks so much for coming over. We're going to get to meet your husband next. Yes, he's Tom, wonderful. And he's wonderful and uh, get to hear his story. And, mm -hmm. uh, so thanks again. My Appreciate pleasure. it. And we'll see you next time on the H. Morgan Files.